sure I feel about this new feature of Zoom. All right, so first up, uh, checkpoint two, remember it's due next Tuesday. I'm not sure how many people are traveling early for uh, uh, Thanksgiving, but you still do whether you're here or not. Uh, so make sure you get it in. Um, we will do a session on uh, next Tuesday. Uh, we'll do a case study. Um, I have a couple that I've uh, kind of got pre-canned a little bit, uh, one about COVID, one about blue bikes. Um, but uh, I've also been doing a bunch of research lately on um, uh, police department pay in uh, the city of Boston. So I might do that. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, depends on what kind of, uh, or how I'm feeling over the weekend, basically. Um, but then remember the actual project is due uh, the week to get back uh, along with homework five. Uh, so just, you know, keep those in mind. Uh, I know, at least for me, I'm not very good at keeping track of dates. So uh, those are coming up. Uh, let's see, we only have like, I think I figured it out, I think there's five classes left in the semester, which is kind of ridiculous. Um, so, oh, another reminder, if you weren't aware already, um, you can find when the final exam is on Student Link, um, as well as just for this class, um, it will be, I think it's 3 to 5 p.m. on Monday the 19th of December. Uh, and I'm about 99% sure it's in this room. So that should be fun and awkward, um, but there's not really any dedicated like exam space at BU's campus. So you end up in classrooms for most of your kind of big exams, which I agree is probably for all of you kind of annoying. It's kind of annoying for me. Um, we'll probably offer some sort of alternate makeup exam. Uh, the other thing uh, to keep in mind is um, basically my plan right now is that week, uh, you know, the last day of classes is the Monday. And then it's like two days of like reading days or whatever. And then final start like the Thursday. This is all the week of the 12th of December. So I'll hold my normal office hours basically on the Monday and the Tuesday. And then I'll probably have additional office hours during like the reading days um, and maybe even do a kind of an optional lecture um, in case we don't kind of get to everything that I want to um, or to kind of review some stuff. So just kind of watch for Piazza. We'll put up the schedule. It's like, I, I kind of have a rough idea of what I wanna do, but it depends on how far we get, right? Uh, so we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, what else? Yeah, so it's just, there's, uh, you know, the end of the semester tends to be a little complicated, so keep your eyes open. Uh, I think that was it. Any questions? Did I forget to announce anything? All right. Um, so moving on. All right, so talking about, so uh, kind of what we're getting into now, right, is like one of the things that we've been saying is that, you know, taking samples is a good way to try to estimate what we know about like a population, right? So we may not have the full population, we may not have, um, you know, or we might have the full population, but the full population is just ridiculously large, you know, so there's a bunch of kind of different scenarios. But what we do is we say, okay, let's take a sample from that population, but what's the problem with the sample? Anybody know? Or what, what don't you immediately know about the sample? Sir? So is it a random sample? So that's a first important thing, as well as kind of considering with replacement and without replacement, what does that do to your sample? Um, and so what's another thing about the sample that would be useful to know. So the size of the sample is is that big enough, basically, for the population. So that's kind of what we're kind of getting into is like, how can we start to get an idea of what that should be? So that because if we kind of just guess, there's no like test, right? Like the only way we know if it's big enough is if we had the actual population or we could calculate the population. If we could calculate the population, we wouldn't be taking samples, right? So we have this chicken and egg problem. We need to know that it's big enough, but without being able to tell by looking at the actual population. So, um, so one of these uh, techniques, right, uh, or one of the approaches is to kind of use a few tools that we know about populations 
um, that we can then use to try to estimate our sample size. Um, so the distribution of all possible sample averages of a given size is called the distribution of the sample average. Let me make my screen a little bit bigger so I don't have to read it off the screen that you all see. Um, so we approximate it with an empirical distribution. And so by the um, central limit theorem, which I don't, I, you know, counselor in training, I don't, I don't know what I thought that was supposed to be all of a sudden in my head. Um, but so the center is the population average and the SD is the population uh, standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. Um, I don't know why I have demo there um, because I don't think I'm ready for the demo. So um, the, but the point a little bit here, right, is that is when we talk about the center and spread, right, is that when the center is around that average, we want to look at how big the spread is and look at how big the basically the standard deviations are away from that center, because that kind of starts to tell us if it was a good enough sample. Does that make sense? Because if it's really spread out, that means that it's not, you know, it's kind of using that example we did last time. We took kind of 100, I think it was like 100, 400, and like 900 samples, and it got taller, right? So it got narrower and taller. So that meant that our distribution is closer to the real population average or whatever we're measuring, right? Because it's narrower, right? Um, the wider it is, the less accurate. Does that make sense? Okay, or the less confidence we have in its accuracy. All right, so talking about the central limit theorem. So if the sample is large and drawn at random with replacement, then regardless of the distribution of the population, the probability distribution of the sample average will be roughly normal. So in other words, like bell shape, so normal distribution. The population mean will be equal to the mean, okay? So if we did a good job, okay, then we know that the mean we're, we're finding is, you know, at least nearly the population mean, right? So maybe this should be better as a roughly equals, but the idea is there. And then the standard deviation will be the population standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. So this starts to give us some tools to simplify how we do this or to, to figure out those sample size or prove whether they're good. So what I want you to look at here, right, is so if we have a population that has an average of 70 and a standard deviation of 10, one of the histograms below is the empirical distribution of the averages of 10,000 random samples of size 100 drawn from the population. Which one? Okay, so I don't know how well you can read this all, you know, kind of towards the back of the room, right? Um, but so this one, uh, kind of the left edge is 40 and the right edge is, I don't know, call it 95. Um, and then, you know, it kind of goes up here in the middle. Um, and then this one is 67 and 73. And this one is uh, about 64 to 75 or so. So what we want to know is which one of these is the histogram that was generated from this activity. All right. So I'm going to ask the class to see if you can figure that out. Do you know how to figure that out? Um, and it can explain it. So how do we know what to do, right? And if we need a reminder, right, it's kind of on the prior slide is that we have the calculation here, right? And so we know that the population standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size will be the standard deviation right, of the, of the um, uh, result, right, or, or the thing here, right, so the, the samples of size of, from the population. So how do we, how do we do that? So the population Right. Right. So, so you're exactly right. So basically, you take the square root of the sample size, okay, and you divide the standard deviation by it, um, and you get uh, the size of the standard deviation that you expect in your result. Okay. So you know this one, the standard deviation, 
is, you know, because we use that curve, the inflection, right? And so we look here and we say, okay, it looks like this one is, I don't know, 10-ish maybe. So that's probably not right. I could do, and obviously I'm going to do the wrong ones first, right? But so we do the same kind of inflection trick here, and we see this is actually about two, so we're a lot closer, okay? But that standard deviation isn't enough. So what we want to do is we look at this last one, and we see that curve, you know, and I know my, my art skills aren't great either. I don't know about the rest of you, but, um, you know, so but you can see that the one is, is about one. So therefore, this is probably the correct history. So in some ways, we actually know kind of what the histogram we expect to see if we're doing a good job. Okay. All right. So the approximate distribution of the sample averages. So this is our picture of kind of the same idea. So we know that the population standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size, that's what N is, is going to be this big, right? And then the population average will be in the middle. Okay, and so that tells us a lot about our data set and whether or not our sample size is a good one. Um, and what we also can get into, right, if you remember from, I don't know, some, some lecture before now, when we talked about uh, the, the central limit theorem, we said, hey, it's even better than Chebyshev's inequality in that we know that, um, whatever it is, two standard deviations is like 95% of your population. And three is actually like 99% of your population. And the nice thing is it's it's not the at least like it was in Chebyshev, it's actually that, okay? So that tells us even more, right? So it tells us we can kind of look at one of these distributions that we get from running our sample uh, sampling and say, does this look right, okay? Um, and I think we have, I'm not sure if we have another example later on, which is a particularly interesting one, but, we know from this sample, right, where the population is going to land as well, okay, or at least the population averages, um, not necessarily. So the example that we might be talking about later is that if we had an income distribution, right, it's unlikely to be a bell curve for like a city or whatever, right, it's likely to be kind of skewed, or we take those flight delays, it's kind of skewed, right? So, but the averages, if we take, you know, the average flight delay or the average incomes or whatever, those should distribute into a, a normal distribution. And that will tell us about the prior, the actual population of what kind of distribution it has. Okay. So that's why this is starts to be really useful. Um, and yeah, so I said basically all that. All right, so when we're constructing that interval, if you stand the population average and look two same deviations on either side, you'll find the sample average. Um, the distance is symmetric on both sides, right? Um, and, you know, so basically this is just kind of like, here are facts that you may not realize about something that has that normal curve um, that you can kind of leverage independently to answer whatever question you're trying to answer. Because you have this really nice feature that within whatever it is, two standard deviations, you have 95% of your samples. And for the vast majority of cases, 95% is enough to give us confidence that it's true, right? Kind of going back to that P cutoff thing before, and we would call that statistically significant, or we can even take three standard deviations and that's 99, which we would consider highly statistically significant, right? It's kind of the inverse of the P cutoff. All right. Um, this is just a visual representation of kind of the same thing. Um, I actually, I even think I have this slide again or similar, um, but basically I kind of got ahead of myself. So, but we're talking about, uh, this is, this is kind of really important to, to know, right? Is that that's where our sample average is going to be. And it tells us about our population because now we have decent samples. Um, so uh, this is actually not written great, right? Because this is counting kind of both sides, right? Normally, like I said, we talk about two standard deviations, um, but so, you know, four blocks, right? So two on either side is gonna give us 95% confidence interval. 
um, and then we get we can do nice calculations on that. Um, and then let's see. So I'm actually going through this a little faster than I thought. Um, so let me actually I'm going to switch to the demo. I'm going to wait for the demo to load. So let's go kind of through a little bit more of an example. Um, so our, fav our favorite uh, flight time delays, um, and we can see this is, you know, kind of skewed over here, but what we want to know is can we you know, assuming we didn't have this kind of population data, um, can we figure out what the average flight delay is by pulling a sample? And one of the things about samples, and yeah, so one of the things about samples is why do we care so much about uh, this? Well, so we want a big sample, right, to get accuracy why do we care like don't we want to just kind of pull the biggest one we possibly can why don't we want to do that like why why don't just go get the whole population every time possibly not quite the answer i'm looking for but i hear you It's expensive, right? So it's just every time you pull more data, however you get it, right? It's just expensive. So either computationally, because you know you have to get more computers to you know run your calculations, or because you have to stand outside in the cold longer interviewing people for their salaries, right? So it's just every time you get a bigger sample, it's more expensive. So the smallest sample you can get while being accurate is what you're looking for. Okay, so in this case, right, we have the data, so we're going to be able to use that to test our, you know, our examples. Um, but obviously, sorry, the expectation is that we wouldn't have the full sample set normally. All right, so. So the first thing we want to do, just because we're doing this for our kind of example, is we want to just, oops, we want to actually figure out what the population mean is, right, and the population standard deviation. So we can calculate those two things. And these are also, so sometimes you do have a population, but you're not sure to some extent if it's complete. So this can also, and I think we're going to talk about it in a little bit, um, but these two pieces of data can also tell us if our sampling is getting us closer to the full population, if we're not sure that what we have is, as I said in another class, the census, right, the complete data set. Um, and we'll talk about that more in a bit. So the first thing we want to do, right, is kind of we've been doing this same kind of thing all the way along. So can anybody tell me what I need to put here to get one of our samples? Uh, 
all of you should have done this in like a homework or in the project or whatever so far. Yep, except there's one other, what's, what's the parameter I want to pass? No, nope, close. The size. So because this function will take multiple size samples. Um, so we want to be able to say, actually, this isn't in, that'll make it a little easier to read, sorry. Um, so this, uh, you know, what we want to build is a function that will take an arbitrary uh, size and then give us back a sample uh, with that size. And then if we're trying to get to sample means, then is that actually off or does it just look off? That's weird. Cursor's entirely in the wrong place. Still in the wrong place. You see it? Like it's not, like it's like in between the two lines. <laughs> well, that's a feature. Uh, here, let me flip it back this way and see if it fixes it. Yeah. Uh, let me see if I can flip it back now. Nope. All right, here, let's try this trick. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God, it's so slow. Uh, if you haven't figured it out yet, I have like zero patience for computers. For example, this is just going to take my last, my natural life, apparently. What I think is funny is that I get annoyed by how slow it is. So what I immediately do is go and add more work for it to do. Because, of course, I just went and opened this again. So I just made it harder on the computer to try to keep up. But hey, there doesn't have to be any logic here. All right, so I think it's the right thing. Let me just make sure this is caught up. And we'll try uh, to get ourselves in trouble again. Oh, look, it's better. Okay, so now we can just make sure I'm doing the right thing. Um, so now what we care about, right, is the flight delays. So this is where the column part kind of comes into play. So we say we want to take the mean of the um, sampled flights, oops, flights, but just for that one column. All right, so now we have a function that will compute a sample mean, right? And so then obviously what we want to do is do a whole bunch of samples. Uh, I think all the codes here, yeah. And so this is going to take a minute. Um, haha, thank you. Oh, this is actually just the function. I haven't actually called it yet. Okay, so personally, I, I, like if it were me, right, I would figure out what kind of all this does. You don't have to know what some of this does, particularly the like more sophisticated like drawing we're doing. Um, but, you know, feel free to try it. But what we're going to do is we're going to go, actually, I'm going to run it so that it cooks while we, uh, not quite, that's the function. So, okay, so there's 100, 400, and 900. But what we're doing is we're going to say, okay, let's get 10,000 sample averages, right, of those flight time delays based on the sample size I passed in. So the first one I'm going to do is 100. And then we're going to take the sample means and we're going to get a table uh, and we're going to put uh, the sample means that we got from the 10,000 and we're going to make a table with that. And then we're going to actually make a, a like a graph, right? Um, and on the X label, we're going to put sample means and on the title, we're going to say sample size and which one it is, okay? And then we're going to also print out because weirdly enough, right? The way Jupyter Notebooks work is that if your print statements are after your graph, it'll still print them above. So it doesn't really matter what the order is. But so we're going to just print what our sample size is, what our real population mean is, and then the average of the sample means and the population's uh, standard deviation, and then the standard deviation of our sample means. And the reason we're going to do that is so that we can see kind of how we're doing, right? 
And so I know I talked about this a bit last time, so I thought, but it, you know, I kind of wanted to talk about it again. Um, and so we did a population size, but hit, uh, we did a hundred sample, a hundred flight sample, uh, and we did that ten thousand times. So each one of them was a hundred, and then we did it a whole bunch of times, and then we took those averages so that we could look at what happens with a distribution of that. And so what we want, right, is we would like this to be kind of tall, right, and kind of narrow so that we get to, uh, a, uh, sorry, like we get to an average that we can be confident in so that we know what the average flight delay looks like. Um, however, if you notice, right, we still see the standard deviation of the sample means is, um, you know, is four, right, which is still quite big, especially if we do the other trick which is going to go here. And so we, you know, we can calculate what we want it to be. And so we're probably going to want it to be lower than that number. And as you can see, right, we kind of can steadily get closer to that one because here, like here, we want it to be a lower number because we have our sample size of 100. And so the square root of 100 is uh, 10. And then the, um, and we're going to divide the population standard deviation of 40 in this case. And so we expect it to be, this is going to give us a four. That, that feels like it's too much, right? We want it to be smaller. And I think I'm going to show some other tricks about that, but we'll see. But so as we start to get bigger, um, we can start getting those closer to what we're looking for, which is the average of sample means is a 16, it's closer to the population mean. And we start to see this two is starting to get closer to the one we really kind of want. And I talked about this a little bit last time, um, but so that standard deviation, we want to get this, you know, getting it down to a smaller size. You know, I have to do another example too. Um, so let me see. All right, as promised, this is taking. Uh, although, I just I just realized I actually have this data already, right? I've already calculated. I could have just reused it. Um, but so this is going to do a loop with all those different sample means, and we get um, we're going to add those onto each other so that we can look at what our standard deviations of all the sim simulated sample means are. Um, and obviously we should actually get slightly different answers than we did the last time because it's doing the sampling again, um, which was stupid in retrospect. I should have just reused the data that I had already collected, um, but hey. Um, and someday it will print it. And maybe we'll, so we'll let that cook for a minute so that I can go to so I'm just trying to say I want to switch topics and it's still taking a long time. Why is this not switching? Oh. Okay. So kind of, this is kind of like another approach to thinking about the problem, right? Which is like, you know, imagine a very simple case, right? Which is that we just have a data that is only 10 entries long, right? And so we know that we have only zeros and ones. And so what we can say though, is that, so we know that the sum of the ones is four, we can take, figure out the average and that 0.4 is the proportion of the ones. And the population consists of ones and zeros, yes or no answers to a question, for example. Um, and the population and mean is the proportion of ones in the population. And the sample mean is the proportion of ones in the sample. And so, you know, if we kind of think about it in terms of, you know, when we pull those samples, we can look at that as the invert or the, you know, to compare to the original population. So we can start to get better. Um, I feel like I'm 
missing a slide. Yeah, so, and this is kind of where we get to the point, which is that, so the total width of an approximate 95% confidence interval for a population proportion is going to be the size of that thing times the standard deviation of the population, right? So, like, like pretend this isn't a number, right? It's just like the label of the population um, divided by the square root of the sample size. So the narrower the interval, the more precise our estimate can be. So if you want a total width of the interval to be no more than 1%, how should you choose the sample size? And so what we can do is we can look at, um, so this is kind of using, how can we do this for the mayoral election that took place last year? Um, so Mayor Wu, um, and so the, if this is how we can do Oh, do I have the other slide on this? Yeah, I knew I was missing a slide. Okay, so basically, how can we do a sample of the population, like a poll, right, for an election, and know what size that should be? Okay, well, so if we know we pull n randomly selected voters, and we're just going to mark a one if they say for woo, or we're going to mark a zero for not woo, right? We're not going to kind of incorporate other candidates who might be running. We're just going to take those those two candidates. So what we can do is we have this, and this is uh, kind of like uh, terminology, right? So we call this P hat a lot of the time, okay? But it's a P with uh, what's called a circumflex in many languages um, over it. And that's the estimate of P and that's equal to our sample mean. So in other words, this is uh, gonna be our estimate, not our you know, real data. Um, and so, if we can take the sum of all poll results and divide it by n, then we have confidence that our p is 0.5% from p or p hat minus p is less than or equal to 0 0.005. So in other words, this is just like the p cutoff, okay, except about uh, the actual estimate of the mean. Okay, so in other words, and it, so it kind of gets, because it's used so commonly, it kind of gets its own name, but think about it in terms of the same thing, is that because it's much simpler to talk about the, the kind of wrong side, you know, because what we want to say is like, um, I swear I had a, okay. So, you know, if you see a, a poll, for example, in a newspaper or something, it'll say, you know, within 3% accuracy, right? That's kind of what we're doing here is because we don't want to say it's 97% accurate, we say it's like plus or minus 3%, okay? We just didn't talk about it usually in the reverse. And so this is to do that same estimate. This is kind of how we would talk about plus or minus 5%, okay? Um, let me see if this thing's done. Right, so what this was trying to show was kind of going back to what we were talking about before, which was that if we take all those sample sizes, right? And I actually just calculated all the samples. Oh, that's why I couldn't reuse it because it actually does all of them. So we do 100, 150, 200, all 10,000 times. Um, then we can figure, we, we can calculate, right? What's the standard deviation of the simulated sample mean? So these are the various sample means. But if we just take the population standard deviation, divided by the square root of the sample size, we can also get to the same thing without running all those samples, okay? So what that means is then we can start to estimate what should this number be, okay? When we get this, you know, basically these are the same number, right? So when this is small enough for us to be comfortable with the result, that tells us the size of the sample. That makes sense? Because we can just calculate it, right? And we can just say, okay, well, 550 apparently is the right answer because what we're looking for is a standard deviation of 1.6, okay? So it's a little like uh, loose, like this is still a little bit of the problem of like, how big is the thing you're trying to measure? What are you trying to measure? Why are you trying to measure? You know, all those kinds of things. So what exactly this number should be can be a little difficult uh, to always 
uh, like to uniformly say, right? But once you know what kind of standard deviation you want to be off of that population, so you want to say 95% of our population is going to be within whatever, I can't do the math, uh, um, 16 plus 16 would be 32, right? So uh, 32 or 64, so 6.4 in that histogram. Right, so if you draw the histogram, if we go all the way back to, oh boy, oh, we're on the other side. If we go all the way back here, oops, not that far, this far. If we want every 95% of our population to be within whatever I said, 6.4 blocks of the histogram, then that means that we need a sample size of 550. Make sense? Kind of. So, like going back to the actual code, like how you can see the column, are you looking for them, the numbers you take from it? Uh, I'm actually making the point that you don't need this number because you can just get this number. If you have the population standard deviation, you can just take the square root of whatever sample size you chose, and you don't actually have to calculate the standard deviation. You don't actually have to do the simulation to figure out if it's the right size sample, okay. right? It, now, eventually I'm gonna do the simulation. Let's say the 550 is the right answer, right? I'm gonna still do the 550 to get what's the average, the actual mean that I want, right? I want this actual average, which I don't know yet, but I can figure out independently how big this number needs to be. That makes sense? Okay, so Exactly. And then as uh, I saw recently, what you often will do is kind of cheat here by taking the standard deviation of your of your sample. Let's say you have a population, right? So, um, you know, the United Airline flights is not a great one because it's, it's it's actually pretty complete, right, in our in terms of what we're talking about. But let's say we did go out and do a sample of, you know, 5,000 people. Um, if we do the standard deviation of that population, that can, if, if it was a good sample, we can actually probably use that for getting the standard deviation. So we know what our sample size should be of that population so that we can get to the actual average we're looking for. Okay. I know it's, it's very like, because, because it's so hard to actually look at the actual problem, we have to use all these techniques that are kind of like, way over here to be able to figure out stuff about the original problem. Um, so that's why sometimes it's really hard to explain because it's like derivative, 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 right? So when we're trying to say, okay, I have some data, right? And what I wanna know is, um, let's say average salary of Boston people, you know, people who live in Boston, right? Um, so what we can do is we can go and, uh, you know, maybe we can get an actual population data for that. So then we can do, the standard deviation of that, but we want to control for that problem of is the salary data we're looking at, let's assume it's not perfectly complete or we're not sure if it's perfectly complete. So what we want to do is sample on that data set to see if the average salary is the same, like is it correct, right? So what we want to do is sample that data set enough with big enough sample sizes so we can calculate the average salary and be confident. We figure out that that average salary is very close to the to the basically the observed average salary. Then we can be pretty confident that the observed average salary and by the extension the sample we took is is accurate, right? But if they're different, it means that the sample that we took originally was skewed somehow. But conveniently enough, because we did that sampling we actually probably have a good average salary derived from the simulation, okay? So we kind of get to the goal either way. Yeah. When we're looking at the standard deviation, we want to that's like close enough, like you want to know it's like close to one ball balance for the idea of like, you don't want to start like two different kinds of deals. Yeah, we'll talk more about that eventually, um, but yeah, ish. Okay. Um, so then, 
kind of by extension, what we want to know is when we're taking that population of salaries, right? We want to know how big a sample we need in order to approximate the, the real census average, right? Um, and so that's kind of, and so what, what's super handy about this is we don't actually have to do the simulation to figure out what sample size that is, right? Because it's, imagine, right, that we have no idea. It's like between 130,000, God only knows, right? Um, so obviously it's much easier if we can just do this calculation it's because it's, you know, you can do that from, you know, if you did it in blocks of 100, between 130,000 in probably the space of 10 seconds, okay? Whereas this, you clearly cannot, as, you know, my computer showed a moment ago, right? Um, so, I feel like there was another point I was going to make about that, but I can't remember what it was. Um, okay, so... Trying to remember. Let me just go back to this for a minute. Okay, so basically, so this is kind of really just talking about how we talk about that problem, right? Is that um, what we want to do is figure out this sample mean, but we want to know, and, and so if it, it kind of, we want to be able to estimate the quality of it. Uh, and so what this is telling us, or, you know, what we talk about this in terms of is we have 95% confidence that this P hat or the estimate, right, is 0.5% from P. Um, and, and so that's, just kind of how we refer to it so that like I said we kind of refer to it in reverse as it's you know we're we're only five percent chance of being wrong rather than 95 percent chance of being right um we've talked about this already um and so I don't like this slide either today. I don't know why. Um, but this is kind of getting at your question, which is like, how do we know how big um, we want of a standard deviation? So, and this is kind of like the standard deviation of, you know, that population divided by the square root of the sample size times four. So in other words, we want, you know, four of those blocks of standard deviations, right? which is gonna be 95% of our population because of the central limit theorem, okay? So if we want, um, so that's gonna be equal to 0.01, right? So, but the, the max total width that you'll accept and the right side is the formula for the total width. So if you kind of plug in the number, that should tell us what we want, which I'm just looking to see if the, yeah, so, okay, so here's kind of getting to the, like, what do you fill in, right? So, in kind of, this is the worst case for the population standard deviation. So, because we can use algebra to flip it around so that we can figure out what the square root of the sample size is, um, is equal to four times the standard deviation of the population um, divided by 0.01. Um, and then the standard deviation, therefore, of this thing is at most 0.5. So, that means that our uh, square root here has to be greater than or equal to four times 0 0.5 over 0 0.01. Um, and so therefore our sample size is the square root of that, um, and, or sorry, the square of that. And so in this case, it's 40,000, okay? Um, because we pulled out the standard deviation size that we wanted. Um, and then the sample size should be 40,000 or more. Okay, so that's how we can calculate the sample size. I knew this slide was here. That's the next one. Um, so this is how we start to explain um, how we can do like a U.S. poll, right? Um, and sample, you know, a thousand people, but have a margin of error that is 3%, okay? 
And one of the things that I'll point out kind of on the, on the bull shrimp perspective, right, is that's plus or minus 3%. So in other words, it's actually 6%, right? Because it, it could be 3% on either direction. So just kind of keep that in mind when you're reading one of these things, you know, that it's, it's actually bigger than it necessarily appears. Um, we don't actually know that from this sentence for sure, but that's how, how they're almost always listed. Um, sorry. Okay, so, so what if we wanted our, you know, we wanted to hit that 3%. Okay, well now the interval width is 6%, right? Because it's plus or minus 3%. So our sample size or the square root of our sample size, greater than or equal to four times 0.5 divided by 0.06 now, instead of the point, whatever I had, 0 0.001. Um, and then do you have a question or, okay. I thought I saw somebody's hand go up. Um, and then we kind of just go through the map, right? And so, but what we can discover is that the population size needs to be, or the sample size needs to be 1,100 people, give or take, right? Um, and so, you know, or technically speaking, um, it should be, you know, all I was trying to say is unless you can find a, a 12th of a person to ask questions of, um, so you're gonna, generally speaking, wanna round it up almost always, okay? Uh, and so, in other words, this article, right, is a little bit off, right, potentially, in that it should be closer to 1,100, not 1,000. So maybe there's off by 100 here. Um, or the, the kind of data in the salacious headline, right, is, is not quite correct, right? Because obviously, this number goes down if this population is goes down. So if the real number of the population of the US is 255, maybe that's enough to make it a thousand instead of 1100, but you get the idea. So that's how we can, we can calculate what we're looking for is that we wanna know the size of error we want, and then we can kind of calculate down to the sample size. Okay, so I don't know, does that make sense? And then once we know the sample size, then we have whoop, these, oops, there's my mouse. So once we know what the sample size we want is, right, you know, basically it, it just starts, you know, we can start, uh, what we're starting to do, right, is, is have a bunch of formulas that we can use to, to make it so that we can actually get to a scenario where we don't have to test everything. Right, we can actually figure out what will give us a good representation of our population without the population. Okay, so and I'm just trying to think. This is worth going through. Um, yeah, so we can go through it. Um, so, yeah. So this is just kind of like if you if you think about that prior slide I showed, which has the uh, you know basically just you know it's a just a voting slide, right? So or a voting population, um, and so we know we have uh, this population, and can we get to the standard deviation of that population? But this is kind of our known scenario. Um, but right. Yeah, okay. So this is just kind of us kind of going through the math to kind of prove it. Um, so we make a function that will figure out uh, the standard deviation of this population. Oh boy, uh, podium's moving. Um, and so that will, uh, yeah, so if we pass in the number of ones, so you know we can kind of do it one time here, and then we have decided what the number of ones will be, but we can kind of do them all at once. And let me, Oops, let me print this. Okay, so in other words, we just kind of are gonna say, okay, you know, our, our little sample population, um, these are all the scenarios it could be in, right? So that we can kind of just say, hey, let's try it for all of it. 
but with a small enough data set that we can actually calculate it in a reasonable amount of time. But if we take the standard deviation, I don't know why I don't have any of these printing. Okay, so zero, one, up. Okay, so now if we take that standard deviation, so we can use our cool apply function, right, on our table, um, and we can actually get the number of ones. So this is now our standard deviation for each of these scenarios, right? When we have a like the population size is the same, but the uh, proportion of ones is changing. So then we get to what the standard deviations would be in those scenarios. So what I was going to show was this one primarily. Of course, this is what's going to take forever. So when we, so basically what I kind of want to show, right, is that this proportion of ones, right, kind of turns into a curve. And so we start to see that it has this like range that it goes through, um, which, and then we got, and then I just kind of have a, a, I thought this was more of a build on the prior one, but this is kind of the, the point is that we see that distribution is like a curve um, and kind of like a normal distribution. And so, but this is kind of the actual example from the uh, slide, which is just, now we know that we have, that's why it was taking forever. I thought it was doing something else. Um, but we did that sample size of 1100. And now we know our population mean was 1600. But we can say, okay, look, here's the standard deviation. And our average, right, is really nicely close to the real average. So in other words, like if we didn't have this real average, we can now figure out, or we can, sh we can kind of show using all those other techniques that this should be within whatever we said, like plus or minus 3% of this number. Does that make sense? So yeah, as I said, I didn't like that slide much either today. Uh, apparently some of them I just like a lot. Um, but I don't know, does that make sense so far? So basically we just kind of learned a few techniques for how do we get those initial, um, you know, kind of variables? How can we figure out what the sample size should be? You know, what kind of standard deviations do we want? Um, you know, and where, so that we can start to be, have some confidence in getting to things like average flight delay without having to look at the entire population, okay? Or even having access to the entire population and also have a degree of confidence that the population or that the average that we came up with is correct, right? So obviously we're never gonna be 100% sure, but we can be really close. Um, and I think we'll stop there, unless there's any other questions. All right. And